All of us here at Vesterheim would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to the sponsors of the water exhibit, Decorah Bank and Trust, Marilyn and Julian Hansen, and Jeff and Marilyn Roverud. Thank you for making this exhibit and this event possible. Now I'd like to turn it over to Vesterheim's chief curator, Loran Gilbertson, who will be the host for today's event and the moderator for the artist conversation. Loran? Thank you, Diane, and welcome everyone. We're so pleased you're joining us today. We'll start by introducing one of the artists, and that would be my Britt Hillstrom, who is a painter, printmaker, sculptor, and bookmaker in El Cerrito, California. My Britt, you're a founding member of Nordic Five Arts. Could you tell us all a little bit about how the group started? Thank you, Loran. Nordic Five Arts was founded in 1993 by Katie Kastep a Norwegian descent artist sculptor. Can we see the slide of her uh, sculpture in Norway? There it is there it on is. the right. Uh, that is a sculpture uh, in Skolden, Norway, located at the end of the Lustra Fjorden, a branch of the Fjord Sonjen Fjorden. This was taken when it was installed in 2011. The picture on the left is the uh, a sculpture that is in the present water show at Bestheimer Museum. Uh, Katie is still active in the organization and we appreciate all she has done for Nordic Five Arts. It was her idea to invite professional men and women artists who were descendants of the five Nordic countries, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland, to form a group to promote contemporary Nordic arts, culture, and design. We have since that time expanded the membership to anyone who is interested in promoting Nordic arts, sculpt, culture, and design. Artist members are juried in by a procedure outlined in our website, nordic5arts.com. We have many men and women members in the Bay Area, but we also maintain close ties with international members living full or part-time abroad. In addition to art exhibitions, Nordic Five Arts promotes educational events for the general public, including art and museum related lectures, dance performance and poetry. Thank you. Thank you, my Brit. Uh, next, we'll hear more about the water exhibit from Mark Ellen Hamill. And Mark Ellen is a painter in Oakland, California. Uh, could you explain how the exhibit water came to be at Vesterheim? Sure, happy to. Um, a few years back, we started talking about um, what upcoming exhibits we might like to do because we'd like to have we like to have a theme that we can all participate in and yet sound interesting to the public so they'll come. And uh, our member Ellen Ferris had at one time earlier, she had contacted your former exhibition manager, Zach Rohevel. And um, in fact, I, I looked at my paperwork today and found out it was back in 2018 when we first wrote to him. And uh, also, we had another connection from Marilyn Hansen, who attended an exhibit of ours out here in California. And I think she put in a good word for us. And so the, the communication began and um, we, we were looking for a theme. So we gathered, we had a number of discussions about what, we, what we'd like to focus on. And um, immigration came up because it's very timely and also the environment. A number of our artists do work in areas where they're expressing things, their feelings about the environment. And uh, then of course, immigration, because everyone in the uh, organization either came from a Scandinavian country or had uh, ancestors from there. That was our connection. So. Um, so we settled on water because it kind of covered all of those bases. And um, in fact, I think we had, I've got to look this up, but we had a, a very, a rather long title. I don't know if it's included um, in the, in the exhibit, but let me see here. Sorry. Which page is it on? Um, well, at any rate, um, it's about survival and um, all the water that, that surrounds the Scandinavian countries, which provides industry. And then we all, at some point, our families had crossed the water to come to America. And so water, water became our theme. 
And I think you asked me before about the curating. We don't really, we didn't have um, the Westerheim curate the exhibit. We always curate it ourselves pretty much. Generally, everyone gets into an exhibit if they choose to, because everyone's a professional artist. Everyone will do something good. The only way we might curate is to say, well, there's only room for one or two pieces and, and then have to make a choice. Wonderful. And so this is perfect timing. I think we'll have you talk a little bit more about your piece in the exhibition. Okay. All right. Well, what really resonated for me when we were thinking about the water exhibit was indeed crossing the water. A number of years ago, I made a painting where I reflected on um, this one here is um, this, this painting here is a small lake in uh, Småland in Sweden, where my, it was on the land where my grandmother was born in, 19, in 1885. And so crossing the water, I have through the years thought a lot about my grandmother because she came over when she was 16. And I thought about how, I wonder what it was like because to me 16 seems so young. And since then, since I've now visited the home in Småland a couple of times, and um, on both times, you walk through a forest in the back of the house, a long way through the forest, and you reach a small lake, which is called Lake Igden. And I was just so amazed. I thought, oh, my goodness, there's a lake on my grandmother's farm. So I was very impressed with that. That was always in my mind. And then when I think about her emigration to the United States, I think about... Um, what she must have gone through at that young age, who knows? But then she eventually ended up in Seattle, Washington, where a lot of Scandinavians, of course, live. And I believe they, many of them chose it because it looked so similar to their home country, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. And um, then, I, then I had a flash that, oh, my grandmother and grandfather built a house right near Lake Washington, of course. You know, the, the family homes near Lake and the new home in America is near Lake. So I wanted to honor that with doing a painting. So when I realized we were going to have this exhibit, I was really focusing on the immigration theme and I wanted to connect the two lakes. This is my way of, of once again connecting with my grandmother. And also, since I grew up in Seattle, it, which is also surrounded by water, Water has shown up in my paintings quite a bit through the years. So um, then, I, then I reflected when we were going to have this webinar about, oh, gosh, I thought back to all the paintings I had that were focused on water. So uh, you can show a few of them here. This was the initial painting that I did when I was musing about what my grandmother might have seen as she looked over over the uh, railing of the boat. Plus, I am an abstract painter, so I like to throw in a lot of things that, that kind of uh, resonate with the moment and with me. So um, that, this is called Crossing the Water, and it was uh, in four feet by four feet, and I painted it in 20, 2007. And this is called Water Totem, and that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Again, it's abstract, but it's like a totem. And this really is my personal feeling about water because of all the, um, all the time I spent around Lake Washington in Seattle. This is called regatta, and it's a reflection on the activities that go on on a lake. And I found this is called Urban Mirage. And I once when I was visiting Seattle, I was walking around Seward Park, which is at the south end of Seattle. And I noticed that the above the hills, the sky, skyscrapers were starting to show because downtown Seattle was growing. It was becoming this major metropolis. And so uh, that this is a reflection on that. And um, I found that it just it just seems to me that uh, since I moved to California, I'm often hearkening back to Seattle and my life there, which there was a lot of water, many bodies of water. So my grandmother and I are certainly connected because of water. Next, we'll talk to Ula Delarios. Ula is a weaver and textile artist in Berkeley, California. Ula, can you tell us about your two pieces in the exhibition? So this is one of my two pieces and I have two in them. This is number, and they're called crossings. And um, 
they are number 11 and number 12. The crossing um, pieces, they're part of a long uh, series of work that take in many different shapes. Uh, they're called crossings before they refer to both the crossing of the threads of each other that are inherent to the weaving process and also because uh, the trousing of the borders that immigrants like me and I am a Swede have to do as we cross both rivers and oceans and uh, when we try to reach our new places to be and also going back, we, again, we have to cross the rivers. Both crossing pieces are made out of linen and are dyed in indigo using the Ika technique. Ikat is the same technique as tie dyeing. The only difference is that with tie dyeing, you use uh, already made fabric, and with ikat, you save off pieces of your yarn from the dye. After the yarn is dyed, in both cases, in these two pieces, it's both warp and weft. And then as you weave, you hope that the colors, the areas that you have colored would fit together. Uh, and it's quite, uh, it, it's not always that happens. So I, oh, well, there's supposed to be another one in between. I'll see. I was born and raised in Sweden on the West Coast. And I learned to weave in my teens from my mom or my grandmother. I lived in an extended family like I do in Berkeley. And um, most mornings, my mama would start weaving early and, and we could hear her loom go dong, dong, dong in the basement and it would wake us up. Uh, as children, we cousins would use her loom as a climbing structure and her warper as a merry-go-round. Weaving was part of my life then and is now. I lived in a small fishing town and uh, near the sea, and the river and, and the sea were very important parts of our life and the beach. I was, I was saying, my crossing pieces started with this piece, which is a petroglyph boat, boat from the West Coast. There are many petroglyphs, both in uh, Sweden and in Norway, and their images are really well known and used in many places. People have them on socks, on uh, bags, and it's also logos for the University of Gothenburg. Uh, this Hellristing is from Schoen, and uh, is, which is a small island in the archipelago where our house is. And it's just a stone throw away and you drive by it when you come to our house. This other one is um, from Tonum's Hede. And it's very close to Norwegian border and is designated as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. I use the petroglyph images as actors in my work. I wove the big boat to carry me across the ocean. The fabric structure of the boat, which you see here as a detail, has a small walking human, I hope you can see it, going back and forth and back and forth. The walking human represent the enormous movement of peoples around the world that's happening today and has happened many times before. Crossing number one, which this is called, is made out of silk and all the yarns are painted with uh, thickened dyes before the piece is woven together. After one more silk piece, I did these, these pieces, which are number three through eight. They're all made out of linen of different colors. They all have areas of walking humans that are woven in. And you will see, let's see here. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Um, and, uh, they all have the word. Okay. I must have lost some of my pictures when I mushed around in the beginning without saving. So, anyway, I used the color of, of indigo quite a lot. And this first piece here is made out of indigo. 
And as I um, worked with them, it's a tricky one to work, uh, but the results are, are wonderful. Later on, the crossing pieces became three-dimensional and again made out of silk. And this is the, what the last ones look like. And thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Luanne. Thank you, Lula. Pam Fingado is our next artist living in El Cerrito, California. She's a painter and a printmaker. So uh, Pam, could you tell us a little bit more about your pieces in the water exhibit? Okay, so this piece is called Migration. Uh, it is 30 inches by 24 inches acrylic on panel. Um, in this particular piece, I used a palette knife, which I don't ordinarily use. And um, it gives uh, more of an effect of uh, streaks of white. Um, uh, and, it, and it helps give the uh, feeling of the movement of water um, in the artwork. The uh, title migration, I chose that because the definition of migration is movement from one part of something to another. Here, water is in constant flow, moving between one space and the other. My intention with this particular piece was to express a feeling of calmness and at the same time, uh, movement and energy, maybe some undercurrent of, um, of um, turbulence, which is something that water holds. It holds all these elements. The piece migration comes from um, a series that I completed in 2018 called um, Meditation Series. Uh, most of my work um, in that series and the work that I do now has a lot to do with meditation, uh, establishing a meditation uh, practice as well as finding some form of meditation while I'm doing the work um, are meditating before I do the work. In this particular piece, the um, circles um, serve several purposes. Um, the, uh, the circles are lying on the, uh, without much depth, are lying on top of the water, or so it seems. They could be a bubble. They could be some type of a window that you can look through, um, seeing more depth and the other smaller circles was inside um, the bigger circle. And um, I put these here because I wanted to create more depth, a more interesting piece besides just the feeling of water moving. It also, the circle also is a symbol for me um, of unity and completion and um, centeredness. And during meditation, um, I will focus on a particular mantra or um, a mandala, and, uh, which is, used, is made out of a circle. And here I could focus on any one of these circles and um, practice my meditation. In my artist statement, I state that uh, water is a metaphor for emotional spirit. The movement and energy and the floating, relaxing feeling of water in motion is inherently what this piece is about. The expression of being moved along by another force, such as the power of water can be exhilarating as well as frightening. And that's what I wanted to show with this piece. I think I did that fairly, um, fairly well. Uh, what's interesting is that um, uh, I moved on to some different pieces once the COVID-19, uh, COVID, started in late 2019, early 2020. And the works that I'm gonna show you now are completely different from this. Um, this is very open and loose. And I went from that particular type of um, technique into something totally different, but they share some similarities. Oops, that's this piece right here. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, so this piece is called, it looks like spring. 
Uh, at the end of 2019, I started working in um, my sketchbook, uh, making little squares, uh, trying to come up with designs. Um, in the squares, I put, uh, there were two inch squares and I would have six to a page. And uh, I would take bits and pieces of recycled paper from various other collages that I've done and use some found objects. Uh, along the way, the little squares were cut out and assembled to put 12 squares onto a larger piece of paper. The squares became from two inch to three inch. And eventually this is what I settled on. Um, these are 144 two inch squares. Um, the pieces of paper and various assortment of other things that are in the squares have absolutely no relationship to each other except that they're, they're just totally, totally unrelated, um, except they are elements of um, design um, and principles of design kind of um, are um, established here. In this particular piece, uh, I'm focusing on the center. Uh, the lines here bring the eye towards the center. The outside perimeter is a lighter color. The inside is a darker color. Um, what I like about this particular work is that there is this variety of all sorts of different shapes and designs going on that are not related and yet they're pulled together in a grid-like formula um, into a, it's a square shape and it kind of comes together. And uh, so you see this, uh, a lot of creativity and a lot of movement and a lot of energy um, but it's held in. And um, this, has, uh, this has to do, this, this centering technique that I'm using also has to do with meditation. So here I can focus in on center and as it gets lighter in color on the outside, it kind of dissipates whatever is happening in the outside world and um, I get to focus on the middle. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, the second piece that I'm gonna show you is, oops, is called Glow. Again, it's 144 two inch squares um, assembled into a larger square. Uh, the focus is on the center. This is, this is, um, dark green in the center and it gets lighter and lighter as you go towards the edges, corners, where it becomes white. And um, I was working on uh, thinking about the center of a lily when I started painting this. And um, you can see the outline, the lines drawn on the outside of the organic shapes of the lily. And um, this again, this was a, a meditative technique where I could focus in on the center and uh, while I'm piecing together all these little two inch squares. And um, I completed, I think six or seven of these pieces and I'm still doing more. I, I have a, I thoroughly enjoy this and um, I'm hoping to have them on my website soon. And that's it, thank you. And would you like to say anything more about uh, the relationship between meditation and your art? Well, you know, the process of meditating is, um, the process of doing art is, uh, is a form of meditation. Uh, you're at once uh, stimulated and yet relaxed. And you're open to um, uh, play and possibilities and intuition. And uh, you're also focused on um, completing the piece. And um, I think a lot of artists share that flow, that losing the sense of time, the sense of enjoyment in their artwork. Um, and I, and it, but I don't think we think about that very often. Um, and that's what it is for me. Thank you, Pam. Okay. Our next artist is Joan Stewart Ross. And Joan is in Seattle, Washington. She's a painter and printmaker, 
And so, Joan, we'll ask you the same question as well. Could you tell us a little bit more about the work that you have in the water exhibition? Yes, I'd be happy to talk about my work in the water exhibition. I have what is sort of a diptych. I thought it would be fun to put these two pieces together. They're called Oyster Estuary, one and two. And they're really inspired and influenced by the location where I have a studio down on the Long Beach Peninsula in Southwest Washington State. The Long Beach Peninsula is surrounded by Willapa Bay on the east, the Pacific Ocean on the west, and the Columbia River on the south. And we're known here when we come and enjoy the bay, we're known for oysters, or the bay is known for the oysters that it produces and has been producing since uh, the beginning of time, but they were discovered by settlers in 1850 who gathered up the oysters with the help of the native peoples, the Chinook Indians and several other tribes of Indians who lived here and sent them down to San Francisco. Each oyster commanded the price of a gold piece. And they went down in big ships, first a railroad from Nakata, which is the village I'm in right now. And uh, then on big ships to San Francisco. So the oyster has been one of the main uh, products of this area. The water in the estuary of Willapa Bay is one of the most, if not the most clean estuaries in the country, perhaps in the world, and is known for the uh, quality of its oysters and the taste of the oyster here. The pieces that I have in the show are done with the encaustic technique. And I thought it would be fun to tell you a little bit about that technique. Not everyone knows about it. It's from the Greek word encaustic, which is en, to or toward, and caustic, which means to burn in. It's uh, from the Greek to burn. And you know, maybe a person or two in your life who's been a caustic personality. So you know how that word can um, have a lot of meanings, but with the medium of encaustic, it includes the use of a flame or a torch or a heating element. First of all, the artist takes beeswax, pure beeswax, and melds in a container. I use a frying pan from Goodwill. The beeswax and damar varnish, which is resin from a tree from Southeast Asia, and makes a molten substance. And with that substance adds pigment, colored pigment to make the colors that the artist wishes to use. And the molten uh, medium is hot. And as it's painted, it cools very fast. And as soon as it is put down on uh, layer upon layer, it is melded, wetted, joined to the previous layers with a torch or with a heat gun so that the luminosity and the glow of the piece has something to do usually with what the artist intends. And that's one reason I use encaustic in my work is because in a way the medium is the message. The artist wants to get across through the medium of choice what the meaning and concept of the work has for the viewer and for the artist herself. So I, on the left, have an oyster floating there, kind of a combo of looking in the shell of the oyster and also the idea of the shell itself. And um, one of the little spats that is a baby oyster floating around there in the sea. And then on the right, a kind of quadrifoil composition of four oyster shells making a, a kind of uh, 
swirling motion in the water as they grow and uh, make something for us that is almost unbelievably beautiful. The oyster shell is um, an incredible textural form that has inspired me living in this area. So I thought I'd uh, look a little bit too at some of the work that I've done during the pandemic. I'd started out with uh, doing drawings. You can see in the back of me, there's one of my crossword drawings. And I was using crosswords that, uh, crossword papers that my husband had finished up. And I started drawing and painting on those crossword papers and using them in a way as a conduit for language, meaning, the mystery of what, what is meaning, communication. And um, in a way, those drawings led me to work abstractly and use them as collage elements in my work. This piece is um, called cryptic and it's uh, in, in a way it's water with the waves of these drawings and the crosswords and the elements of the unknown, maybe even an oyster or two floating in the piece. It's a drawing, it's not an encaustic painting. It's about 50 by 53, so it's a big piece. And I had uh, a couple of pieces called um, Virus Series Fear and Virus Series Blue Coil. Maybe they're coming a little late, later, so you'll see them too. Let's go to the next one. I was using uh, the inspiration of water for the next one called Pomona. And what water uses for, it's what it has to do with the fruition of things that come out of the water. This piece, the word Pomona is again from uh, Latin and Greek that means fruits or trees or uh, growths. And this really inspired me to use shapes and forms that had to do with growing elements that come out of water. The next one is called One Dish, One Spoon. And I had, was influenced by a book I read, uh, I was reading at the time by Barry Lopez called Arctic Dreams. Barry Lopez had spent many years in the Arctic, both uh, the Arctic above us here in the United States and the Arctic above the Nordic countries, also Greenland and the Yukon above Canada. And he has written a fabulous book about his experiences. And one of the things I learned was that the Inuit peoples have a law called one dish, one spoon. And I was making this piece, I was thinking of his book, I was listening to it actually, in an audio book and thinking of his experience of the waters around him, the mists, the fog, the ice, and how water was a, a, an element of surrounding him, but also something that he could experience as a visitor and then use as inspiration for his own art. Well, the literature of this book literature is a huge uh, influence for many artists, brought me to the Inuit law, one dish, one spoon. And the Inuit peoples feel as though their territory is like a dish and sharing it is given to others with a spoon. I gave a little talk the other day about color to a friend's class and a woman from Toronto was in the class and she said, she's dealing right now with native peoples in Toronto that are um, using that law or that saying as an inspiration for all of the work they do for the people, uh, Inuit people in Canada. The next piece is called an Adumbration. 
And it's a piece I was doing also as reading, uh, as I was reading Barry Lopez's book, Arctic Dreams. I would recommend it to you highly. Um, and I learned the word adumbration while I was listening to the book. It is a word that means toward the fog or toward the mist. And in the book, Barry Lopez was bowing to the inspiration that he had for his life that he got from the waters and the mists and the fogs and the ice of the Arctic region. And I think I must have added three oyster-like shapes there. I didn't really know what they were at first. There were drawings, I cut them out, I'd colored them, and all of a sudden pinned the tail on the donkey. They turned out to be inspirational shapes for me that had to do with the oyster forms and the, um, the mystery of how animal life and it has to do, what animal life has to do with the waters from which it emerges. I also included a couple of slides of work that I'm working on right now. This is called Myriad One. It's an encaustic painting with collage elements. There's those oysters coming in again that uh, seem to have for me to do with the pinwheel feeling of motion, kinetic motion, the idea of um, confusion perhaps, of unrest, maybe having the parts flying apart, but also coming together in a kinetic motion of uh, whirling and twirling, almost in like in eddies of water. I have a, another one in this series that shows you it in process. Maybe that's going to be at the end. I wanted to include these pieces. These are my pandemic pieces that you can see were the background for some of these drawings. These are on crossword papers collaged together and drawn. This is a virus series fear. And the next one is virus series blue coil. Uh, and the third one is called Nordic Curl. And it, it shows you how much I have been impressed by Nordic uh, stave churches and the mystery and rhythm that is found in looking at the uh, design qualities that I've found in stave churches. My colleague and friend, Christy Ilvesacher, took me to several stave churches in Southwest Norway. And I've always been impressed by the knot like quality and the mystery of how the curves and curvilinear forms make a question mark. So both literally and figuratively so that you don't really know what the forms are about. You can follow them and then you get lost and then you come back again, almost like uh, being in a conundrum. So Nordic Curl was one of my pieces from the pandemic. Then the last piece that I have to show you is what's in process now in my Seattle studio. On the left, um, I have a, an encaustic painting that's coming together. I'm not sure what's going to happen to it. When I get back to Seattle right now, I'm down on, now on Willapa Bay, as I was telling you about the oysters. And on the right is a new piece called, I think I'm going to call it uh, pinwheel, because it does seem to have that motion that it's developing as I work. So one thing about working with various media is that artists like to switch their media, switch their concerns and their concepts and don't always work with the same things. I work both with encaustic, collage, and drawing materials. So some of the big drawings that I just showed you are there on the wall on the right of this picture of my studio. And the elements, just as in nature with water and air and fire and earth, 
come together in an artist's mind, I think, and help the artist distinguish what it is she wants to say, but she doesn't necessarily always have to use the same media. So I love to use encaustic and drawing materials, sometimes together and sometimes separately. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. We're going to return now to my Britt Hillstrom. And um, I'll give me a moment. I'm going to switch out the slides, too, to share with you uh, of her work. And get that up here. OK. So my Brit, um, you have been using the theme of water for quite some time. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about that, as well as the piece that you have in the water exhibit at Westerheim. The first time I can remember using the water theme was at one of our first solo exhibitions, one of my first solo exhibitions in San Francisco at the uh, Nanny Goat Hill Gallery. I had a small room installation illustrating the hydrological cycle. That is the continuous circulation of the Earth's water. Water evaporates from the seas, forming clouds. See, I have some cloud earrings I made from titanium. I don't know if you can see them. But anyway, uh, water evaporates from the seas forming clouds where it condenses and falls as rain or snow to start the cycle all over again. There is no new water. Our water is billions of years old. I hung from the ceiling in this small room, a chandelier-like form consisting of handmade paper, which I had made, and thin plexi rods to represent a waterfall. An audio tape, which the audience could listen to by earphones, starting with the sound of a single drop of water to a thunderstorm and back to a sim single drop of rain. The audience was also invited to write on a wall-mounted piece of handmade paper their thoughts about the importance of water. Uh, the slide being shown is life flows from stone. I identify myself as a multimedia artist. Rembrandt, Michelangelo, and especially Leonardo da Vinci did not limit themselves to one medium. There is a whole smorgasbord of choices, and I find it impossible to choose just one. In 1994, I was given a grant and invited by the town council of Ma'ala Tarshiha Israel to participate in the International Stone Sculpture Symposium held in Malot. This cascading water sculpture weighs four tons and is the largest I have ever done. New slide, please. This marble wall work entitled Not a Drop to Drink is about three feet by six feet. What happens when no fresh unpolluted water is available to us? We perish. About two thirds of the average human body is water. About 3% of the Earth's water is fresh water. Of that, only 1.2% can be used as drinking water. Most of our drinking water is from rivers and streams. I have a handmade book entitled Rivers from A to Z. It portrays rivers and they are all polluted. New slide, please. Running Wave. This sculpture is made of Carrara marble and is nine inches by 27 inches. Israel has developed desalination methods to use salt water as drinking water. The problem with this is that desalination increases fossil fuel dependence, increases greenhouse gas emissions, and exacerbates climate change. In addition, desalination surface Water intakes are a huge threat to marine life. What are the alternatives to expensive and harmful effects of desalination? Number one is water conservation. Two is water use efficiency. Three is stormwater capture and reuse. I can remember having a water barrel for the rain when I was raised in Chicago. 
for is expansion of the use of recycled water. These alternatives cost less and are proven effective. Other benefits are pollution abatement, habitat restoration, and flood control. Slide, please. Tsunami. This 1998 sculpture is of Portuguese pink marble and measures about 15 inches in all dimensions. Tidal waves pose a threat to all our coastlines, especially where nuclear power plants are located. Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant and surrounding area was destroyed in 2011 by an earthquake and tidal wave. Every day now, thousands of workers struggle to clean up this 860 acre site. Shutting it down is, to shut it down completely is expected to take decades. Meanwhile, radioactive cooling water is leaking and mixing with groundwater. Slide, please. Water everywhere, nowhere. In 2003, I made this accordion book using woodblock, monotype, fiberglass, screening, and collage. It is 11 and a half feet tall when extended. This book includes examples of the runic alphabet, which was first used by Scandinavians between the 3rd and 17th centuries AD. Many of the monuments using the runic alphabet are thought to be memorials for lost at sea mariners. This was not a spoken language, but only a visual language. Slide, please. Silver Mist. This a 2016 monotype and prismacolor triptych is printed on Italian vapor, it is 30 inches high by five and a half feet wide. Silver Mist illustrates the beauty and wildlife habitats of our tidelands, which are being destroyed and need protection and restoration. Slide. Woven Wave. In 2015 in Athens, Greece, this sculpture, wall sculpture, was in an exhibition combining the works of Athenian sculptures and San Francisco Bay Area sculptures. This diptych of French red marble and titanium is a combination of old and new material. Such a combination is a great metaphor for the present dilemma of balancing the need for water for commercial purposes and the need of our bodies and environment for clean water. Slide, please. Visby rooftops, Jutland, Sweden, or Gutland, some people speak. Visby, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, was the main center of the Hanseatic League in the Baltic Sea from the 12th to the 14th century. Note the Baltic Sea in the background. I painted this watercolor in light drizzling rain while visiting Visby in 2017. Slide, please. Runic Alpha Book. A handmade book, a combination of woodcut, monotype, and gold leaf. When extended, it is nine inches high and almost eight feet long. It illustrates the runic symbols, and the one for water is on the right. I don't know if you can see it. I should, can't point my finger at it. <laughs> my parents were immigrants from northern Jämtland, Sweden. They met in Minneapolis in night school learning English. My father loved to fish and every vacation was spent in northern Wisconsin camping and fishing. It reminded him of Sweden. We still, uh, uh, he was instrumental in acquiring some property up in the North Woods. And there he taught me to fish, mainly catching sunfish and bass, which we ate. Later, when I was teaching my own children how to fish from the cliffs, of the beautiful Northern California coastline, I caught a cabazone that was full of tumors. I was shocked. Needless to say, we did not have that for supper. How could this be? We are not protecting, but we are polluting our waters. Slide, please. The disappearing. 
It is a wood block on suede mounted on wood approximately two feet by three feet. While habitat loss and pollution are important reasons for the decline of some species, the greatest threat by far is overfishing. Slides, please. Abalone Falls is a triptych monotype woodblock print on canvas with fiberglass screen overlay. It is six feet high by seven feet wide. Again, I was shocked when an international trader in the fishing industry told me that the Pacific Ocean was, quote, fished out, unquote, and that the factory ships had to travel to the Atlantic coast of Africa to find fish. Slides, please. I should explain, too, that in the background of this webinar, I uh, took a picture of my view, it's very fortunate, and it has the Golden Gate Bridge, and it's, you can see uh, San Francisco Bay. So uh, it is beautiful, but the Bay has had many efforts to clean it up. And uh, some have been successful and some more work needs to be done. And it's a constant monitoring of the quality of the water. Salmon in Flight is a triptych monotype and woodblock print on canvas with fiberglass screen overlay about five feet by six feet. 40% of the mercury that finds its way into fish originates from coal burning power plants and chlorine production plants. If we are exposed to high amounts of mercury from food and other sources, we could then develop severe or even fatal effects in our kidneys, lungs, digestive tract or cardiovascular system. Slide please. Seafarers 2 is a woodblock print on suede mounted on a wood panel two feet by five feet. While walking on a pristine beach in Goa, India some years ago, I came upon washed up needles and medical waste. The public surely needs to raise their consciousness about the necessity of taking care of our habitat and our food, all of which are dependent on clean water. Slide, please. Hook Net Dynamite is a small handmade book illustrating the escalation of fishing with a hook and line, as I did, to fishing with huge nets that entangle and kill other marine life. This has led to dynamiting whole marine habitats, resulting in death again to uncommercial species and even whole coral reefs. Slide, please. The Japanese uh, Mizu is this work, and this is uh, exhibited in the water exhibit at Westerheim Museum in Decor, Iowa, <laughs> which where some of you are located <laughs> and some of us are not. The Japanese Mizu is the Japanese word for water. And um, this is my woodblock monotype and mixed media print with bamboo rod that is in the exhibit. About six months before the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, I returned to Japan where I had studied with master woodblock printer Toshi Yoshida uh, many years before. This was an art and textile tour where not a moment was wasted. Nordic countries are particularly noted for their textiles. I have rag rugs woven by my maternal grandmother and beautiful wall panels embroidered by my mother. Finding the textile for this work in Kyoto at the textile center, I fashioned it as a noren. And a ren is a Japanese type of curtain or room divider. Naturally, I had to incorporate my interest in water and fish into its creation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, my Britt. The themes you're using of uh, environmental protection are certainly timely uh, in light of our recent observance of Earth Day. And another one of the artists in the exhibition who often uses environmental messages is Tracy Benson. Tracy is uh, coming to us from Canberra, Australia, and she is a video artist. 
Tracy, you've got a, a video piece in the exhibition. Could you tell us a little bit more about that one? Oh, hi. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, look, it's, firstly, I'd just like to say it's amazing seeing everybody else's work um, because I've been a part of Nordic Five for a few years now. So, um, yeah, it's been great to sit here and, and take it all in. Um, I can swap over just to show you some stills. Um, yeah. So the work I've got in the exhibition is, is called After the Fires and it's an ode to the Murrumbidgee River, which is the river very close to where I live. And um, I filmed uh, the river not long after we had what we call Black Summer. So I'm just showing you a, a screenshot uh, from my website. So, um, and I'll share some links as we go. Um, yeah, so this piece, uh, I went down to the river after we'd had a full summer of bushfires and um, which was devastating and our particular area was um, we were smothered in smoke for about four months. And so when it finally broke rain after the fires, um, one of the first things I did was go down to the river to see um, what it was doing and, uh, and I was very... Um, shocked, I guess, to see that the river was uh, smelt very strongly of the smoke and the, um, the debris from the bushfires uh, had been carried along the river. So, um, so this piece was really a dedication to the cycles of environment and um, water has been a part of my work for quite a long time um, and this work is part of an umbrella project called Words for Water, which seems to be resonating with a few of the artists here. Um, and this particular work, uh, I found out that um, a, a friend of mine and a colleague had passed away and she's a, also a sound artist and did a lot of sound healing work with people in the Western Desert of Australia. And um, we had an event in 2017, which was called From the Mountains to the Sea. And it was all about how the river connects through the system to the ocean and how we're all connected through water. And she um, spontaneously created a, um, a piece with violin which responded to us gathering and also the environment around us. So um, after she passed, I asked her partner if um, they would be okay with me sharing this video uh, and, and incorporating her work into this video piece, which she was really happy for me to do. So, um, so the, this work for me um, seemed very timely as well uh, with the water exhibition at Vesterheim. Um, and, uh, and I guess it sort of echoes some of the concerns that have come from this project over the eight years. And the initial, um, so I might just show you a little bit of, some of the other um, work that's come through. Where are we? So, and this is a project, uh, the website's actually wordsforwater.art. And the project started um, back in 2013. I was down um, on the border of, of New South Wales and Victoria. Um, and um, I was really shocked to um, be at the Murray River, which we call the Mighty Murray, uh, and the riverbank was so low that a lot of the, the um, trees were not holding onto the shore. The, the, um, the red gums were dying. Um, I was completely shocked at the state of the river and um, also I'd been working a lot with the Yorta Yorta people, the Indigenous uh, people of that region and um, very attuned to, to the knowledge that they'd shared, which I think is quite universal, that if the river's unhealthy, we're unhealthy. And, um, and that sort of provoked the project. So what I, I did just as a response, I put onto Facebook, I had a Facebook page and I just asked people what their words for water were. Uh, I had no idea how people would respond. Um, but I was really interested in, in what might come back. And 
what happened was about 80 people responded with their words and I realised that that was when this project really could um, be something to, to sort of focus on and this is an example of some of the languages and the words that came through. Um, so that sort of initiated uh, the first work, which, um, again, is all on my web website under the tracybenson.com video. And the first one, if you go right back, sorry, I'm doing a lot of scrolling here. But the very first work, actually, I took um, screenshots of uh, from Google Earth from the source of the Murray River, which is in the mountains to the south of me, um, all the way to the mouth of the Murray River. So uh, that travels through uh, about a third of, of uh, the country and, um, and then overlaid that with the words. And then uh, a number of people contributed um, audio to that um, piece. So it was a layered sound work that also featured in that initial piece. And that's uh, really sort of how the projects emerge um, because I would gather the visual content quite often and then people have often uh, contributed and shared their um, audio. So um, another one that is worth having a look at on that note is called Aratoroa Wai. And um, that's a project that brings together song and story in, in the Tereo, the Māori language, and it was all shot when I was in New Zealand and collaborating with um, a Māori artist who works a lot with um, themes of environment and water. Um, so, yeah, so that's... And then there's another one uh, which I did close to where I grew up in Queensland, so I actually grew up in the north, and this one was the Mary River, which incidentally was my grandmother's name. So uh, that project was the beginning of a connecting the water to ancestry. Uh, and I think I'm talking a bit more about that a little bit later. So, um, oh, and I'll just, just uh, point to, I also use augmented reality. So I play with video, uh, AR and, um, and still photography. So, um, just as different ways to engage people with my work. So I think I'll probably hand back to you, Laura Ann. Thank you, Tracy. And yes, we'll be coming back to Tracy with another question uh, shortly. But next, we're going to meet Diane Resnack. And Diane is in San Pablo, California. She's a painter and mixed media artist. And um, so if you click uh, end share, there we go, perfect because we've got some images to share for Diane as well. Diane, your piece in water has a very different theme from many of the other artists. Could you tell us more? Yeah, hello everybody. Um, well, I explore water images as a metaphor or an archetype, uh, reaching deeper feelings. Sometimes I call it the language of the soul. Um, I am a dream artist. I have worked from night dreams and written down over 5,000 dreams in my life, and I've made hundreds of images from them. This painting is one, and this is a nightmare image. Um, years ago, when I began dream explorations, I, I started with a repetitive nightmare image of drowning dreams. Uh, this is of the North Waters and this kind of sea monster. Um, Years ago, I started to paint a different, uh, same theme, but different image. Uh, and uh, it evolved quickly into this next form, the next slide. This is called Leviathan, by the way, this one. But the next slide is a big swimmer image. It's a detail of a five foot wide acrylic painting. And um, for four years, I did paintings of fantasy swimmers in water. I don't swim in waking life. Um, but this original drowning, frightening thing evolved into this kind of harmony of figure and water, female figure in particular, and water. 
and eventually a spiritual image and a healing image. I did many, many of these paintings. And now, later, occasionally the water image surfaces, as in this next slide, which is at the Westerheim Museum, uh, which is called Rainbow Sea. Uh, so it's acrylic glaze, which is pigment stretched in a lot of medium. The medium dries clear. And uh, so it's, if you think of a watercolor, you know, you layer on translucent colors. Um, you can't tell from this photograph because you only see the last layer, but most of my work you can see through different layers, um, which creates what we call glazing uh, in acrylic and even oil much earlier. And it, this has a smooth finish to it. And I think that the technique suits the dream image, the glazing technique. Now this picture is very, very bright. A lot of my work isn't bright, um, but this combination of glazing with exploring dreams works, works for me for quite a long time. Um, much, much earlier, I was an oil painter, abstract, in impos using impasto, which is thick built up uh, paint, just the opposite of this. Um, with this painting and many others, I finished it off with white contour, white paint contour drawing. And some people have related to my work referring to Japanese uh, drawing uh, and contour work. Um, I don't think of that myself, but it's some feedback I've gotten along the way. Um, I like the fluidity, the ever-changing shape of water, and the connection to the deeper soul. And it can be, like in this painting, very joyous and playful. Uh, the next, last water slide, the next one, is uh, another water image, uh, different approach. Uh, this is only 18 by 18 inches. The previous works were many feet wide. Um, this is kind of a watery bubble. It's two, two canvases, a little one and a larger one. Um, and then my final slide is totally different. It's a drawing of my Finnish grandparents. I relate to the country of Finland. Um, these people were immigrants. They came to Ohio and they influenced my art making hugely because they made things with their hands. My grandfather was a cabinet maker and my grandmother did all kinds of things with her hands like caning this chair. And in Finland, she had gone to school where she learned weaving and um, dressmaking and designing. These people did not know English. I did not know Finnish. My memory of them are when I was earlier than five years old, I would spend hours on the floor of the cabinet making shop of my grandfather. And I'd be very content and um, really joyous just playing with wood, wood scraps and sorting things out and arranging them. I was a preschooler then. He died when I was five. So that's the origin of my art, that man in particular. Um, their families in Finland went on to be uh, prominent uh, builders and architects in two different cities. I visited these people in recent years, whereas my mother never did. So anyway, um, I, that concludes my, my brief presentation. Thank you, Diane. And we'll be back with Diane for a final question soon. We have one more artist to meet, and that's Emma Lundgren. Emma is in San Francisco, California, and is a mixed media artist. Uh, you have a mixed media piece in the exhibition of water. Could you tell us more about that one? I do. Hi, everyone. Yes, it's um, so this piece uh, is in a part of the exhibition and 
um, it's a wooden uh, carved spoon with Swarovski pearls into it. And this is to symbolize uh, the sustainability of what, when you make something by hand, you are most likely to keep it rather than if it's in plastic, you probably more likely to throw it away. And also you bring this uh, Corsa, as we say in Sweden, um, with you on your journeys to pick up water, to drink, uh, or give to your dog, whoever's with you, and you usually keep them for a lifetime. And so the Swarovski pieces are kind of giving that rich spectrum of water. It's kind of continuously fluid uh, running through and kind of reflecting your surrounding from the northern light or the flowers or the sky, um, everything kind of around you. So having this energy and calmness together. So I will continue showing some pieces of my work uh, in the presentation. Um, see if I do this a little better. So I'm a mixed media artist. And um, as Diane was saying that her grandpa was very influential to her, so was my grandma. She is the one that kind of taught me of the craft um, of always reusing pieces of material and was telling a story through what you do. Um, so here is one of my pieces that I've done. So it's based on the folklore dresses in Scandinavia in the Nordic countries. Um, all of these pieces, you might look like it's fashion, but I'm kind of in the middle of product, fashion and art. So the pieces can be standalone or they can be used as uh, pieces for a photo shoot, like here. So I'm using kind of the fashion scene or the art fashion scene to kind of communicate. Uh, and these pieces that I've been making is all from different materials um, that I've found or been given and using techniques that my grandma taught me. So some of these are kind of uh, an experiments between a fashion color, fashion piece of color, but you can also hang on the wall. And I think this is also what kind of the charm with the Scandinavian culture, some of the folklore pieces that you wear, you can actually have them in your environment, in your home. So um, we're using old tablecloths, um, using the dollar horse uh, pattern and kind of putting that together. So this collection here or the pieces I made was um, how I wanted to kind of make more a modern statement of the folklore dresses. So I created three different folklore dresses telling stories um, from where I'm from. I'm from the quite close to Gothenburg. Um, so you have to use certain specific colors you also have to be handmade, hand-stitched. So all these kind of small um, symbols in the folklore dresses actually gives away where you're from and what region you're from and kind of where you belong back in the days. And these are usually quite heavy. So I made them kind of more modern and upbeat. And these pieces um, have been shown around in Europe, has also been to New York, um, some of the museums. Um, just to kind of talking through like the new way of looking at Scandinavian culture. So here you can see the dollar horses, which has been screen printed, um, put back together. So all of the things and cloths I'm making, I sometimes put them back into kind of a, a fashion piece because I want the pieces to come alive. I don't want them just to be uh, put away in a box. So if I can use them uh, in a photo shoot or as a glove that maybe can be on a shelf, but also be used, um, that's something I kind of want to get my work out there and I just use fashion as a, as a placement for that. And here is, I work a lot with uh, photographers and stylists. So either if they're placed on the body um, or they can be placed by themselves. So the, the kind of the graphic, the emblem here is actually from one of my um, aunties. They have a little emblem on their folklore dress as a little brooch, which tells them for what region they're from. So what I did, I redrew it and I screen printed it and I put it back together for like a color um, that you can have as a statement of piece in your at home, um, or you can use it as a, as a color, which we have here for the photo shoot. Um, this photo shoot was um, made from um, a catalog for, this, for Stockholm Fashion Week, where they kind of want to emphasize on forgotten culture. Um, so it was really nice to be part of that. Um, also, I do a lot of like hand drawing, which I would put into kind of more digital uh, elements and stories with a strong underlying message. So I always want things to look very um, drawn, energetic and maybe playful so people can get like energized by it, but also happy. But always in all of the pieces I do, there are these underlying messages. So if you look long enough, 
you will definitely see there are um, uh, hints of where it might be coming from. And this is also something that goes back to my Scandinavian background, that you always want to tell a story uh, of, uh, of the icons that you're wearing on the folklore dresses or the weaving cloth that you might have on your home, on your wall. It's all this kind of relating, going back from generation to generation. Um, through my work, um, I've been also lucky to make these one-off pieces. So this was a request from um, a magazine in New York uh, doing a fashion week. So they wanted to look at how can you um, sustainability and fashion go together. So I made this one of piece of hats where um, again using the Dala horse as you can see as a kind of a signum and all the patterns that goes around it and I cut them out and I put them back in together so this is kind of symbolizing uh, the midsummer <laughs> um, hat pieces that you can have or the folklore dresses but in a more kind of upbeat way. Um, so this hat was also then later on bought by a place um, in New York, so it still it still has life and traveling, um, traveling around. I think on this uh, ongoing exhibition. Other pieces here was uh, me translating uh, for a scholarship I got to translate the kind of Scandinavian culture, and this is from Gubbjörn in Skansen in Stockholm. So I took inspiration from this building and then translated all the kind of motifs uh, into different pieces. So. Uh, doing a lot of hand drawing, but also always kind of cut it back, take it, cut it out or embroider it and then put it back together. And again, all of these pieces now are put on the body just to show how they can kind of come alive, but they can also be kind of one off pieces and stand alone. Like the hat is actually a lamp uh, shade that you can have hanging, um, but we used to here as a hat in the photo shoot. So raising awareness is a very sort of strong message that I love to have. Um, and this is also raising awareness, environmentally awareness about how um, textile and fashion industry actually can destroy the environment and the water, especially. So the midsummer halo where you have with flowers, how would that look like on a very extreme level in the future? Um, this was a, a piece I did that you kind of have to save the flowers uh, in jars in the future to be able to kind of keep the tradition going. Um, it was this was a piece that was part of a larger exhibition um, that traveled around. Oops, sorry, traveled around uh, Europe uh, about four years ago. And kind of the last pieces I've been working on um, is crafting for attention. So again, I kind of do a lot of drawings and embroidery, laser cutting, bonding materials together. Um, here is on a, a vest that I created, and this was to raise awareness to. The Sami people that live in the north of Scandinavia, um, raising awareness about their tradition and the way they live um, and their kind of motifs that they have. And um, I'm using my art to do this kind of attention drawing. Um, and I'm also lucky that these pieces uh, got a lot of attention um, in more like a political scene as well. And so um, I'm always very happy when I can support different small communities with my art, even though, again, it kind of very colourful and playful, but has that kind of underlying meaning. And here's another piece from that uh, exhibition that I did and some of the pieces that kind of started out this, the Corsa part of the pieces that I'm showing now at Vesterheim. The last piece um, I just wanted to show is where I am at the moment, is kind of still manipulating different materials um, and use putting the back on kind of on the wall rather than using uh, the body. So here is some pieces that I've been using the heat press, uh, embroidery and mounting them on different materials. So kind of coming up with new materials that kind of mimic the leather in a way and combining it with the wood. So um, yeah, that's, that's what's happening right now. And that was the last slide. Fascinating, Emma. It's interesting to see how you've been influenced by your Scandinavian ancestry and how that has shown up in some of your works. Yeah. And uh, Tracy, I think you also wanted to comment a little bit on how you've been influenced by your Scandinavian background. I, yes, thank you. Um, I've, I'll flip back and um, just going back to the project I talked about called Words for Water and offshoot of that 
project um, that evolved has been called Waters of the Past. And that um, really connected to my ancestry from my father's line, which originally came from uh, Dramen, which is about uh, 30 minutes from Norway on the train. Um, and so this project is, has really unfolded um, by starting to try and find information about my family in Norway, so um, which is sort of uh, at the beginning was really difficult because uh, we don't have relatives we can connect with. And um, there was lots of different stories even about what happened with um, my ancestor coming to Australia. Um, so that sort of prompted the beginning of the project. And, um, and the story was that he, uh, Anton Benson, he uh, was a merchant seaman. Um, so there's a strong connection again to water. And he originally went to New York um, and then he uh, didn't stay in New York. He then came to Melbourne and jumped ship. And that was, uh, he was a deserter from his um, ship. And that was always a big um, discussion in our family about um, did he jump ship, didn't he jump ship? Well, I did some digging and found that he was on the deserter record um, and that really, I guess, opened up this project in a very interesting way for me. So in, um, so in 2016, then I started to really uh, explore um, iconography like the runes uh, more deeply. And I also went over to, um, initially I went in 2016, I went to the Faroes and we travelled for a month on um an old fishing sloop, like a, a boat from the 1880s. And that was, I really wanted to do that. And it was an artist residency because I wanted to understand what it would have been like um, for my ancestors, all of them, to journey to Australia um, and the sort of conditions that they may have experienced. So that was um, a, a very uh, eye-opening experience. <laughs> um and then uh, after that, I went to Dramen and um, the following year I spent three months in Dramen as an artist in residence. And, um, and that was sort of at the same time I had connected with um, and there's a, I, I write a lot. That's another thing. If you've got time, um, I've got a lot of stories in the blog. Um, I connected with an artist that, that was making music from his DNA and um, he developed a software package. So we worked together uh, to create some work that um, related to that. And, um, and this is the work here. It was shown in 2017 while I was in Norway. And so this work, uh, the, the imagery for the work came from my ancestral church, which is in Hurum, close to Drammen. And the sound piece was composed from DNA music. And we worked together. I found instrumentation and we selected the key. And then the DNA basically was the, um, the thing that drove the composition of the music. So, um, and this is, I just uh, wanted to just share a little story before I hand back that when I went to my ancestral church, across the road there was a studio and um gallery uh there and i started talking to the the curator there and i said oh you know my my work is very meditative and she read that as oh i i do meditation and and so she invited me to present this work in in a um in a night that they had focusing on art spirituality and environment and um so i i led uh, a meditation, I just played the video and I asked people to, you know, if they wanted to, they could watch the images or they could just listen to the music. And then at the end of the um, the screening, I told them that the music was my DNA and explained the story about coming from, um, from you know, this original place um, in Hurum. And it was just a very interesting conversation which unfolded after that. And you can just see here uh, another thing that for me connects with water is relationship to trees and, and ecosystems. And I was really sad, this tree that you see here, um, when I got to my church, I looked in the graveyard, I couldn't find anybody that I was related to. And it was quite a, um, 
I was really disappointed and I was quite emotional. I sat underneath this tree and then I realised that this tree was really old and that this tree had witnessed my ancestors. And that was really something now that is driving a lot of my work is that understanding of time through different species and uh, that's why this tree uh, ended up being so prevalent in this piece of work because I couldn't connect uh, through the written word or through the um, uh, the record with my um, ancestors, and but I could actually connect with this tree who would have witnessed the um, baptisms, the marriages, uh, and the story of my family uh, from Hurum. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that continues to be very influential in my work. Um, and I'll hand back now to you. Lorraine, thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, we're going to go back now to Mark Ellen Hamill and uh, find out a little bit about what you've been working on now. You're muted. There we go. Hey, well, actually, I've gone back to painting, which uh, might sound surprising since I'm listed as a painter, but I'm also a... Um, I also have been a printmaker. I, well, I am a printmaker and a collage worker. And um, during the pandemic, like the shelter in place last year, earlier last year, my studio, which is in um, a decommissioned shipyard, we were not allowed to go back in because at first, you know, everything was closed down. So um, I took a lot of, well, I had at home a lot of my previous monotypes that I no longer was um, going to work on. I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll collage them. So luckily I had these at home and I started collaging, cutting up and collaging old monotypes that I thought were unsuccessful or just weren't finished, but have very good parts. So I got really involved in that. So I spent a number of months um, working in collage and it got very satisfying. It was a lot of fun, actually. It was kind of more lighthearted than painting. I, I tend to get very deep and serious when I'm in the studio working on a painting. So um, that was, it was a, a very good experience. In fact, at one point I took some of my collage work and I, apply, I used images and I applied for a show called 5050, which is an annual exhibit at a, at a local gallery well, uh, in California, whereby 50 artists do 50, 50 artworks in 50 days. And I thought, oh, well, this is, I think I can do that. And so um, the pieces are all six inches by six inches. And so every day I would work on a collage and sometimes make more than one because six by six was, um, was pretty easy to finish. And I was very intrigued by it. I liked it a lot. I had been working in collage, but in a different way previously. So now I was cutting up my own previous work. So that was re really a neat thing to do. And I really enjoyed it. And um, then as time went on, Things opened up even at my studio in the shipyard, and I could go back into it. And so I've, now I, I have a new process where I do collage at home and I do painting in the studio or printmaking in the studio. So um, now I've gone back to painting more. And what happened with doing the collage work, and especially the, um, it was a very, the pressure, although it was a very light pressure of having to do one a day, I got, I loosened up a bit. And so I got back to um, my painting and some of that looseness translated back into my painting, which I was really happy, happy with because that's been one of my long struggles is I get too, I get too tight and I want everything to be perfect. And then sometimes a painting will get overworked or lose its lose its um, excitement because it's been worked too much. So, so that was, um, that's what I'm working on now. I'm back to painting more and collaging less. And um, I'm happy with what's, ha with what's going on. The, um, the, in this slide that you're showing now, Lauren, on the left, you see this large blue painting and you, once again, you could see water in this. This particular painting was a reminiscence of when I had visited Scotland with my sister and we walked through the moors and this is the part where we're staring at the waters. And then the, the, the piece that's straight on is, is called Subterranean Blues. And it also relates to water. So water seems to crop up in my work a lot. 
And do you have uh, another slide? This is Calm C. And even though um, it's uh, getting a little tight again, <laughs> I, I really was, was satisfied with this because now I've got a combination of movement at the bottom and calm, straight feeling at the top. So I was happy with that. And then there's one more slide, I think. Yes, okay, this is the most recent painting that I did. And this, I'm, I'm feeling very good about the way my work's going now because it, it, it does have more of a looseness. And this painting, which I just finished, uh, I guess it was a few days ago, um, which I had worked on a year ago, but I came back to it and I worked on it again. And I wanted to show you this one because lo and behold, water shows up again. And in this case, it's, um, this is called the confluence. And there is a place where we go hiking in Northern California where two rivers come together. That's why it's called the confluence. And so this is a memory of walking through the woods and the brambles and then coming to the confluence. So, um, so that's, that's where I am now. I'm back to painting, still doing a bit of collage at home and very happy to have two studios, <laughs> one at home and one at the shipyard. So, so that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark Ellen. And we'll stop back and check in on Ula Delarios to see what you've been doing lately, Ula. Okay. I will see if I can share my screen. I will give it a better attempt this time. Okay. Um, I am talking about my new pieces as well. And some of them are what I call art and some of them are for useful um, purposes. The new pieces are all collected under the title of Old Yarns, New Work. I've been in the situation of being given an enormous amount of yarn by friends and relatives. I once asked my friend Gisela where she bought the wool yarn I'm using in this piece. And her answer was that it had been given to her. And she thought that even then, you know, it went further that it had been passed on many different places. There was lots of it. So I felt the great urge to use it up. I felt like they has to stop sometime. This yarn cannot go on to another person. So I started making these rugs and they're very specific in the, the uh, squares are a certain size for a very good reason. Um, and they're also made what is called four salvage rugs, which means that there are no fringes. The yarn, uh, the work is, is completely covers the warp, just like the Navajo rugs do. Um, this is the first one and I made another one, number three. This is uh, again of the other, th there's three of them all together. In our house in Sweden, I have a small human, loom and I've been using to weave pieces of yarns that come from my mother's, one of my mother's cousins, her name was Margit. Her mother was a professional weaver who did uh, special commissions for an interior firm, interior design firm. Margaret left me two big boxes of yarn. One of them was this little tiny rolls of, or balls of wool like this colored in all kinds of different colors. Margaret was a biologist and these balls are part of the results of a natural dye project she did many, many, many years ago. She collected all the plants and dyed the wool for each one. And, uh, but she also used uh, indigo and cochineal. She was a scientist, so you can see that there, there, every ball is marked with a little tag and there's a certain code for it, depending on what plants she used and whether the yarn was gray or white to start with. Unfortunately, I don't have the code, so I don't know exactly what she did. The, the whole thing is a mystery to me. So what do you make out of small balls of yarns? Well, in Sweden, we often eat outside. And so I made shawls. I made shawls for my sisters who are always very freezing when we sit outside. So that's what you do. The second big box of yarn that I got from Maggit contained these types of boxes. They are boxes of a French, really strong smelling soap. And inside them 
are little pieces of cardboard with different embroidery yarns wrapped around them. Um, the boxes were organized. There's a numbering system to them that's the same as are used by the company that made these yarns. And uh, I just didn't, again, I was thinking about what could I possibly do with these? And then I saw a special quilt and I knew right away how I was going to use it. So each little square on this one, I had, you know, first I had a, a warp on the loom in Sweden already. I saw the quilt in the United States and couldn't wait to get to Sweden and start working on this, job, this uh, piece. Uh, the warp is a singles linen that a friend of mine found in her father's attic. And, uh, and I saw that I could weave in and these uh, pieces of, of cotton in this piece and it's called Magit's DMC. So I use, I title all this work by the number, by the name of the people giving it to me and what kind of yarns it is, kind of to honor them because I have waited, I have gotten so much from my friends. My friend Gisla, the one who gave me the yarn to start me, start with, gave me this box, this uh, little cabinet full of the most beautiful linen. It's a very fine linen. And I tried many different ways of using it and finally decided that I would settle for making a banner out of each color. I tried mixing the colors, but it never really showed the color, the, the color that I wanted. So this is a piece, it's hanging in a gallery in San Francisco and each banner is represents each of the colors. And of course I had to weave in my little walking man into one of, into each of them. Some of them all the way across, some of them big, some of them a little smaller. Uh, about a year ago, I learned a new technique and it's called ply split twining. It was discovered in the, in the desert between India and Pakistan. And uh, it was used for camel girth, the, the kind of uh, big band that, held, that holds uh, the saddle on a camel on. It's a very interesting technique and I immediately thought that it was perfect for rugs. So from Gisla and my friend Catherine, I had all this wool in my house and I made the rope. So first you have to go ahead and make these four ply ropes. Uh, and then the technique is that you open up the two plies and you stick another rope through it. And that's how the, the piece holds together. So- well, look, yeah. Sorry, we can't see your slides changing. You can't see my slides changing? No. No. Sharing is paused. How could that be? Okay. Um, let me escape and see if I can do it again. I can certainly see it. I wonder why you don't. You, you could use it just like this. We can see them just fine now. Okay. So this is the, uh, so this is the cabinet of yarn. Here's the piece. So you haven't seen any of these. No, just the very first one is all we were able to see. Oh, <laughs> well, that's too bad. Anyway, here's the first one, the second one. Oh, and here's uh, the little balls of yarn and the shawl. Here's the pieces of box of, of, uh, of soap boxes. And here's the piece I made from that. This is the cabinet of, of yarns. And this is the piece in in the city. And now I'm working with the ply split. So this was the first of the rugs I made. It's uh, about um, 30 inches by six feet, seven feet, I think, all told. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's all finished. Uh, the, the angles are made as part of the, uh, of the technique. And this was very colorful. It's a little too colorful for me. So the next one I did, I dyed it, over dyed the yarn and uh, made it a little water, wider and a little, uh, and a little broader. And here is uh, a, a short um, close up of that. 
And I was going to finish with the fact that my studio is being rebuilt and our house here in Berkeley is being rebuilt. So I will not have a loom to my disposal for a long time. So since this technique is totally by hand, you just have a small tool that you use um, that makes it possible for me to be able to work even when I don't have a loom. So thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry about the sharing didn't work out. Well, that's okay. We got to see them. Thanks, Willa. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And we'll end with Diane Rusnak. Uh, Diane, what have you been doing since the pandemic began? Well, I want to say the year has been a very difficult year emotionally. Uh, I live alone and I'm used to uh, liking alone time, you know, to do art, all of that. But it was so extreme this year, uh, isolation from people. Um, that one thing that happened is I was not able to um, focus on painting uh, large canvases or any canvases. What I did was return to colored pencil work drawing. Um, and I returned to a form I used years ago, which is this form. I don't have a slide, but it's a sheet of paper on which I have four squares. Pam was working in squares. And these are four inch squares and hers were two inch. And um, these are different dreams. And sometimes they're the same theme, sometimes not. I call this pandemic dream journal. And it's very light. I don't do heavy light and dark in colored pencil. And, um, and that worked just really well because it was, um, you know, intimate, up close. Uh, it reminded me of being a kid, you know, coloring, uh, a whole really good feeling. And now in my life, I've done 40 of these panels, several recently. Um, so I connected with an old form and an old series and I extended it further. So now I have over 250 four inch squares from dreams. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased with that. Um, so anyway, uh, the world's moved on and all my friends, all my older friends are vaccinated and um, I am too. And we can return to uh, seeing each other in cafes and museums and uh, things are better. Thank you, Diane. Yes, uh, we look forward to that opportunity of seeing each other in person again. Perhaps you might like to come to Besterheim to see the works in Nordic Five Arts Water Exhibition. You can also see those online at besterheim.org as well as bios of the artists and uh, artist statements for each of the works. Thank you very much for the generous support of those who made the exhibition possible, Decora Bank and Trust, Julian and Marilyn Hansen, and also Jeff and Marilyn Roverud. Thank you for the sponsorship, but also thank you to our artists for participating, and a special thank you to those who participated today in this fascinating panel. You'll all be receiving a post recording, uh, or sorry, a post event email this week with the full event recording, and the recording will be posted on Besterheim's YouTube channel. So if you have friends that weren't able to make it, we encourage you to invite them to see it then. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank Bye -bye. you, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs>